Today we have with us Chicago-based writer, musician, photographer, and longtime astrologer Ray Grassi, who I am delighted to host on the Wisdom Keeper podcast. He is the author of some eight books, including Stargates, The Walking Dream, or The Waking Dream, Signs of the Times, and his most recent work, more than 500 pages, When the Stars Align, which we will unpack slightly in today's episode. I discovered Ray's work in 2019 in preparation for my own class, Return with Elixir, which was a amalgamum of Jung and Tibetan Buddhism. And I found his work in a series of lectures he was providing titled Secrets of the Esoteric Traditions on YouTube, which I devoured and enjoyed immensely. That, of course, was in the lead up to the Saturn-Jupiter conjunction of 2020. It was some 2019 late stage. We were in, We little did we know how the world would forever change. So it's under those auspicious circumstances that I came to uh, really appreciate Ray Grassi's tremendous body of work and contribution to the fields of esoteric knowledge and astrology. Welcome to the podcast, Ray. Thanks for having me. So I would love if before we jump into your uh, biography a little bit to get to know you a little bit, I, I want to just put out a statement which encapsulates the Wisdom Keeper podcast and see without without uh, without, you know, giving too much detail, I'd like to just get your spin on a short statement. Sometimes we have to go back in order to go forward. Any thoughts? Well, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my first book, The Waking Dream, uh, which was really the result of almost 20 years of work, but certainly 15 years intensive work, most of that was spent studying the old traditions. And the reason was, the, the impetus for writing the book was to look at Carl Jung's synchronicity theory but from the standpoint of traditional wisdom, traditional concepts of symbolism, of correspondence theory, of synchronis synchronistic uh, antecedents to Jung's theory. And uh, what I discovered there was that, well, it's like the old saying about, what is it, whatever is new is old again, whatever is old is new again, something like that, because a lot of what you find in the old traditions laid the groundwork for synchronicity and a lot of modern ideas that are being refashioned with modern terms. Um, so not to overly venerate tradition in the sense of there are new ideas that come along and there are breakthroughs. And it's, I think there's a, it's a synthesis between the old and the new that we're looking for. And that's, that's my comment about your, your thought. Wonderful. That's great. And, uh, you know, in a way, the Wisdom Keeper podcast is designed to broadcast the message of people who hold esoteric knowledge and such as astrology in your case, but other esoteric uh, knowledge in the hopes that at this sort of cusp of this transition that we're going through, there may be much more interest as consciousness sorts, try to sorts itself out. How do we put ourselves in the best foot forward? In a way, there may be, there may need to be, or is incumbent on us to sort of sort through some 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 blind spots that we have that may have roots or solutions in the past. So this is this is this in this episode, I really want to focus on astrology because I don't know what your take is on if you find that there's a growing interest in astrology, but certainly there since the age of reason and, and, and the scientific revolution, you see a, a lot of pushback and skepticism on astrology. Uh, so maybe we can just keep that in the ether for a second and get to know you a little bit if you want to take us through your Campbellian hero's journey a little bit and how you you know, came into astrology, what it meant to you at the time, how, it is, how you've matured with astrology, and if you want to throw in your, your mystical side too, your, your, uh, your, your mentor there, Shelley, and, and the esoteric traditions, I, we'd love to, to get to know you in that vein. How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I'll try to do this simply. Um, I, I first heard about astrology. I grew up, you know, I was a, a kid of the uh, 60s. And uh, it was, you heard, astrology has been around forever. And it was something that you heard celebrities talk about on talk shows. And I read a book 
uh, by Joseph Godavich called, uh, I think, Astrology, the Space Age Science when I was 15 or 16. And I read Yogananda's autobiography, which talked about astrology. So it was there. It wasn't some obscure idea, but it certainly wasn't as mainstream as it is now. But I started studying with an astrologer um, when I was getting adjunct credits at Columbia College in Chicago. Uh, there was a, a teacher named Maureen Cleary that I studied with. That was She had been teaching psychology at the University of Chicago before she became a full-time astrologer. And that by itself fascinated me, the fact that she had this academic background and then segued into astrology. And then I studied with Goswami Kriyananda and Shelley of the Kriya tradition. And uh, those were my three main teachers, though I wound up you know, studying with others and reading countless others and um started to do what uh, horoscopes and in a, in a year or two i will have been into the field for 50 years mm. and it has evolved a lot for me it's it's i went from a more simplistic view of it and the interesting thing about the teachers i had was that they were very different in approach maureen cleary was psychological astrology she she had co-taught with uh, uh, james hillman at the university of chicago she had this incredible brain. She's now passed on, unfortunately. And Kriyananda had more of a nuts and bolts approach, though he also brought in an esoteric component like Shelley did, Shelley Trimmer, about, you know, astrology as a language of consciousness. Mm. So I had this very diverse sort of background, and I tried to synthesize those in my own work. And uh, over the years, I've, I've, I, I think back to I mean, just doing thousands of horoscopes over the years, you evolve and you learn from your mistakes and I've made plenty of mistakes. And uh, I've developed a certain way of looking at charts that is, I think, a, quite a bit more nuanced than when I started out. And, um, but, you know, Shelley, it, it, a lot of spiritual teachers don't bring up astrology. It's kind of, not that it's verboten, but it's not really considered an important part of the practice. And it isn't in terms of it's not essential, but it's helpful. It's like, it's not necessary to know about, you know, auto repair, but it is if you're living a life and you drive a car. So the same way as astrology is an incredibly valuable tool. If it, you know, if it doesn't go to an extreme and anything can go to an extreme. That's the thing when people say, well, you can get too far out. Well, that's true. You can get too far out and too extreme and obsessive about meditation. You can get too obsessive about any subject or discipline. So it's a question of striking that balance and using it as a tool where you don't have to look at your, your planets every time you go to the store to see if mm -hmm. you're going to you know, have danger or problems. So, um, but then just to segue into the mystical side of it a little bit, um, I, I just treasure immensely the teachers I studied with, and I don't, I don't consider myself a mystic in the sense that they are. I mean, I'm, I'm not on that level at all, but I certainly have an interest in that, and I've had certain experiences. And uh, Kriyananda was this very down-to-earth double Taurus teacher in Chicago in the Kriya tradition, very, quite profound. And Shelley down in Florida, who had studied with Yogananda, was... Uh, a, <laughs> really profound in terms of uh, just uh, unbelievable in terms of his knowledge and wisdom. And I studied with him, uh, uh, which I feel very privileged to have had the chance. And I, I related quite a few of those dialogues in the book, Infinity of Gods. You had a chuckle there. Was there a story that flashed across your, your memory about Shelley's incredible profundity? Well, oh my God, how do you distill the ocean into a, you know, a teacup? Um, it's, it's that he knew things, like I, I've, I've studied fairly broadly in terms of things like astrology, the chakras, uh, life after death, et cetera, et cetera. And he had all of this knowledge at his fingertips where you could ask him a question and he would immediately have an answer that he could talk all night, literally, excuse me, about a given topic. And yet you never saw him reading a book. Mm. Priyananda said he never saw him reading a book, and yet he had he could he had this voluminous esoteric knowledge about things, and he um, whether whether it was magic or astrology or you know alternative archaeology or astronomy or quantum physics he had a, a base of knowledge in quantum physics too which was you know kind of surprising, 
So, and then he would talk about Yogananda and he had all these personal anecdotes about Yogananda that put a very different light on Yogananda than I got from books. And I don't mean that in a negative sense. Mm. It's like you saw the human side of Yogananda, for instance, and a lot of, I don't know if your listeners know much about, you know, some people may not even know who he is, but he was mm. probably the most famous yogi of the 20th century in some ways with his autobiography. And, um, and, but he had a real struggle because he was trying to keep this organization going and he had a lot of responsibilities being a CEO basically of Self-Realization Fellowship and that took its toll on him. I think he, he died at a young age, 60 or 61. Mm. And, uh, but he packed a lot into that lifetime. And uh, Shelley, you know, had great affection for him and said though he was, you, know, you could tell from what Shelley said that Yogananda was very burned out from the, all the responsibilities. Um, so back, I don't know if I'm answering your question or not. Yeah, it's just nice to get a little color there because I know, I know how, I've listened to a lot of your lectures and I know he, he was much loved by you and it was a significant figure in your life story. So it's always nice to just shed a little light on qualitatively what the man was like. Yeah, so I, thank I, you. I, yeah. I don't want to leave out Dido. The teacher, when I studied at the uh, Zen Mountain Monastery for about, about five months in the uh, mid 80s, uh, in upstate New York, it's a, a really substantial uh, Zen center uh, near Woodstock that uh, is based pretty much on Japanese, uh, well, it's a combination of Rinzai and Soto styles of Zen. And I studied with the teacher there, uh, Dido is his uh, Zen name, but his real name was John Lurie, L-O-O-R-I. Great photographer, by the way. And I studied with him. And so I got a Zen and Buddhist perspective, and uh, which was interesting because I saw both the differences and the similarities between that kind of Hindu yoga esoteric approach and the Zen approach, mm. which it's interesting because some of the practitioners in those traditions saw themselves as, well, we're very different from them from, you know, the Buddhists are very different from the yogis and the yogis are different from the Buddhists. And some said that anyway. And yet when I studied with them, I saw it really was very similar mm. in the basics as far as what they were really trying to achieve in terms of mind control and the enlightenment sort of uh, trajectory and that sort of thing. And so that was immensely valuable uh, to study with Dido and he, he passed on as well. All of those teachers I studied with have passed on, but, um, so anyway, I wanted to throw that into the mix as well. Mm -hmm. Do you do you want to share a particular experience of yours in your meditative journey, or do you want to keep that private? Yeah, it's, uh, I, mean, I go into that in the books. I mean, I, I, I hesitated for years whether to write about those things. And I thought, I'm not talking about enlightenment here. So it's not like I'm trying to say, you know, how, how elevated I am. These are, for, for an experienced meditator, the things that I experienced were somewhat rudimentary. They weren't anything you know earth-shaking but for example you know i had this one experience at the zen monastery uh and the part of the reason i went to the zen monastery was because i've always had a, a difficulty stilling my mind it's always been this restlessness and i knew that if someone if i sat down in a zendo and they're you know they're basically not standing over you with a whip but they're you don't move around you don't you don't fool around in a, in a zendo so I knew that that might be the one thing that got me to really center and to discipline the mind, than to sit still for lengthy periods of time. And it did work to, to a great extent in the sense that um, I had a couple minor breakthroughs where, where I was sitting still and the pain was so severe in my legs from sitting cross-legged for a long time that I just plowed into the technique that much deeper. It was counting the breaths. It was a very simple technique they start you off with. And I, I zeroed into it and I just, I, like I say in the last book, um, I, I simply became present. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of, and this sounds grandiose and I, I almost, well, I, I kind of burst into light. Mm -hmm. And it was just this extraordinary sensation of a samadhi type of experience. And there's different kinds of meditative experiences. Samadhi type experiences are just one. That's like a focused concentration thing that, you know, I call it like a supernova type of thing. A critical mass is the metaphor I use from science. Mm -hmm. But there are other kinds of insights and other kinds of meditation experiences and styles that a person can engage in. And um, 
you know, and then I, there's other experiences. I remember once, um, yeah, I call it, uh, I had an experience once where someone I knew was going through a tremendously hard time. And I just felt, someone I was close to, and I felt tremendous empathy for this person. And I sat down, this is in the mid eighties, I guess. And I sat down and I just did a meditation of a kind of a blessing for this person. And I just did that for, I think it was like two hours uh, of just focusing. I had a photograph of that person and I just poured love and forgiveness and not forgiveness, but blessing towards that person. And something happened that I can only call a heart orgasm. Mm. And I've heard women talk about this in connection with childbirth, um, where it's just like this, this explosion of love out of the heart that just permeated my whole body. Mm -hmm. And that's not such an unusual experience. I've talked to a lot of people that have had that. So I'm not trying to say it was anything particularly special. But the reason I bring that up is it was a type of meditative experience that was very different from the one I had at the monastery, which was not really in the heart so much. Mm. And then there are other experiences where I, there's one I go into and uh, the sky stretched out before me that had to do more with a kind of a realization of, of, of uh, oneness or whatever. And that wasn't like the either, either of the other two. You know, there's different mm. kinds of meditative insights that you can have. And I think each one serves its own purpose. Um, you know, and I've just scratched the surface. I've known people that are, you know, Way, well, like Shelley and Kriyananda that describe insights and, and you can, I don't want to overemphasize those things. Like I had a friend that made a very, I think, telling point once when he said that we had been talking to someone that was, that had made a comment about uh, longing for some kind of mis mystical awakening, you know, like, oh, I wish I had that experience that Joe Blow was talking about. And my friend, uh, <laughs> My other friend made this comment. He said, you know, you can meditate for what? At most, most people meditate for 20, 30 minutes a day. Some not at all. And some might, if they're, if they're living in a monastic setting, it might be for hours a day. But you spend the bulk of your time just in ordinary experience, yeah. just being an ordinary person. And you'll have people, for instance, that that might have great insights and great meditative experiences, but they can kind of be assholes. Yes, right. to say the least you know, it's like so what's more important well i had this great meditative experience but you know it, it doesn't cancel out the other 23 hours of the day so right. the really important thing I, I i think i've come to realize at my age that the really important thing is how are you on a daily basis just being an ordinary person yeah. how centered are you how kind you are to people that sort of thing so that's that's been an I think a really important shift uh, in in terms of my own practice. Yeah, I mean, I would call the what what you're referring to there is the important part is the integration. I mean, you can get a glimpse from the mountaintop, but you've got to come back back down to the marketplace. Same is true with the recent phenomenon and all the uh, use of psychedelics. I think people are having massive breakthroughs, temporary breakthroughs, real breakthroughs, legitimate breakthroughs with great value. But, you know, you, you, if your house is not in order when you leave it and you come back down from the mountain, you've got to get your house still in order. Yeah. So I think that's a, and I, and I really respect your humility there. I know you don't want to cast or broadcast a message that you, you're, you're sort of, you were a little bit hedging on like announcing or discussing or describing the experience, which I respect. I, don't, I think there's all too many sort of glorified accounts of these sort of things. So I really respect that. And, and at, the, at the same, at the same time, not to minimize it either, because I'm sure at the time at Zen Mountain Center, that kind of experience brought home to your own world everything that you had admired or seen in your teachers. So it makes it makes awakening relevant to you finally. And I think it gives a lot of reinforcement that all the path that you're on, there is legitimacy to it because now you've you you've you're able to catch a glimpse of seeing the world from another point of view. So. I think that beautiful middle way, you're embodying a beautiful middle way between these two extremes of sort of underplaying it and then overplaying it. So thank you so for, so much for that. If I if I could ask you then, you know, given those sort of meditative experiences, would you would you be willing to discuss maybe, you know, greatest challenge up to date in your career? What's well, been the uh, well, the restless mind, uh, the monkey mind. <laughs> and uh, and and you know, uh, it comes back to the point it's because of that monkey mind, you find you can easily, I say you, but I can easily find excuses not to meditate or not to you know, sit and practice. But 
there's a tendency to think if I can't do a full blown meditation for 20, 30, 40 minutes a day, it's, I'm not gonna do it at all. And I, I, that's another shift that's taken place for me. If I can meditate for one minute a day, like before I fall asleep, before I go to bed, you know, sit and meditate for one minute, even that's valuable. So it's, it's doesn't have to be an all or nothing sort of approach. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that's, I think that's really been uh, uh, really important for me. Mm. And you're, you, you recently uh, in the process of recovering. So did you expect this recent bout of illness during the pandemic? Uh, well, I knew that I had some difficult planets. I mean, just to be upfront, and I've talked about this in interviews before, but I had two different cancers and, uh, and I had a major operation to deal with one of them, bile duct cancer, a Whipple procedure, they call it. So basically since December of 2020, I've been recovering from that. And, um, and I basically been on my back for the last year, you know, because it's my energy levels have been low and I'm slowly getting back. I won't say to normal because it's not like you're ever out of the woods completely with cancer, mm. let alone two cancers, but I'm a lot better. And um, I mean, I can at least talk, you know, six months ago I was whispering, it was just a, a whole different wow. situation. Incredible. And uh, so I, I think I'm, I think I'm on a, a pretty good road to recovery here, but I don't, I don't get complacent. Uh, what was the question again? I'm not sure what you were asking. Yeah, we were talking about your greatest highs in terms of meditative experience. Then I switched gears on you and I went for the, you know, the most your greatest challenge. You, you sort of talked, talked about a broad challenge in terms of your concentrative ability or distraction, monkey mind. But then I asked you about recently the, you know, your recent illness and you're in recovery now, but, you know, give us a little bird's eye perspective into your own personal mind 50 years into the process of combining all these esoteric traditions including astrology what aid do they give you in the midst of like real human crisis or real human the real you know the real brush with human the human condition uh oh it's an interesting question um i'd like to believe that behind the day-to-day -day annoyances and frustrations and uh physical pains I might have because I have some, the after effects of the chemo have been pretty horrible uh, in some ways with neuropathy and all that, that there's still behind all that and even behind the monkey mind, a certain kind of peace. Mm. You know, it's, it's like, I, I can still get annoyed. I can still get angry. I can still get not so much depressed. That's a funny thing. I haven't really been, struggling with depression so much. Um, but it, although there are negative moments, absolutely. And I still can behind that stay kind of somewhat in a witnessing uh, vantage point and watch it and realize, you know, there's a bigger picture here. And that's been really helpful. You know, now that's hard to keep when there's some real physical pain going on, like right after the operation, it was pretty awful. Mm. And uh, you do your best, and uh, you know it's everybody. It's something everybody goes through it's at some point or another with their their body, and uh, and that I think is also that my one of my teachers made a comment once. I think it was Kriyananda. Someone asked him, "How do you deal with suffering, and how do you deal with um, well, how do you deal with suffering?" And he said. I always keep in mind the fact that there are people that are have it much, much worse than you. Mm. And that sounds kind of simplistic and maybe a truism, but I think that's true. You know, you, you know, this uh, tragedy in the Ukraine yes. has really brought that home, you know, where you see people, you know, 85, 90 year old people having to, you know, being refugees, having no food or getting shot on the street and you, you know, it puts things into perspective in a way like nothing else can. So, mm. I mean, I think that conceptual pers perspective, I think, can be useful as well. Well, thank you. And I just, if people are listening, just uh, we want to wish you speedy recovery and all well for, you know, a return to wellness as much as possible. Ray, thank you so thank much you. for sharing. Let me um, just ask you a little bit. I had a recent conversation with John Michael Greer, who's a prolific author in the esoteric world. Yeah. And I asked him to give us a little bit of a intellectual history on the history of esotericism. And I wonder if you, maybe in an abbreviated form, give us a little bit of a 
intellectual history on the development of astrology. He actually started in pre-civilization in sort of the, he went back to Lumeria and, uh, and, and um, you know, before, before consensus or mainstream history to, to, yeah, as a starting point, yeah. <laughs> pre-civilization or, or, you know, like an advanced civilization prior to Samaria, for example. Um, Freddie Silva has also been on the show, too, and talks about that, too. I wonder, I wonder where you would start with the, with the story of astrology. Well, I, I, I don't think, I can't speculate about Lemuria and Atlantis simply because I just don't know. But, um, you know, I, I kind of touch on this in the chapter Homage to Astrology in my new book, where I talk about imagine going back 200,000 years or 100,000 years, whatever, and that the earliest forms of astrology were probably omen astrology, where people looked at the signs and symbols in the environment as far as you know, shooting stars or comets or eclipses or the passage of the, the sun through the sky or the phases of the moon, etc. And it started with very basic factors like that or the, the certain stars held certain meaning. And it built up, you know, it, I don't think it started with personal astrology, but like in the, if you go back to the uh, Babylonian Omen series, they made a distinction between terrestrial omens and celestial omens. And that's really critical towards understanding something about the basis of astrology. And what I mean by that is that the celestial stars and planets and eclipses and all that uh, was one part of a larger worldview which saw everything as symbolic. In other words, it wasn't just the sky. If, if you saw a deformed animal coming down the street, you know, like the example I think I've used before is if you see a, a two-headed dog coming down the street or a goat, that would immediately be something that the priests would focus on and say, now, what does that mean? And they would catalog these things over centuries of time mm -hmm. and watch to see if something happened to the ruler the same week as this animal was seen, or if there was an earthquake, did that have some meaning? So there wasn't just star symbols, it was the entire environment held symbols. In other words, astrology is fundamentally based on a symbolic worldview. Mm, In other beautiful. words, when people try to understand what makes astrology work and they're looking to quantum physics or gravity or electromagnetism, I think they're missing the point. It's not that there aren't those forces. Uh, it's that that is really just, you know, that, that's that's the mechanical side of it, the, the symbolic side of it, and I, I use this analogy, this example ad nauseum, I realize with people, but in the Native American tradition, when you have, let's say, a child being born, and you see a deer running by, what do they call the child? They, na they name it running deer, for example. It's not because there's some force field coming from the deer. It's not because there's electromagnetism electromagnetism or quantum waves or something it's because that event has symbolic meaning the other example was i had i worked with a woman at the theosophical uh, society in the 90s here in wheaton illinois and i worked with this woman named maggie and i became quite close to her she was an older woman and she was kind of in her later years and she had a stroke and uh, she worked at an adjoining desk to me in the office and I went to go visit her during, you know, she had a stroke and she was kind of in hospice and I would go visit her. And then I, she was right towards the very end. And um, I was riding my bike through one of the local forest preserves and there's a, a bridge that goes over a river in the forest preserve. And as I'm riding my bike over the, the bridge, I see a deer swimming across the river. And I'd never seen that before. I mean, I've seen deer many times in the wild, but I'd never seen a deer crossing the river. And I thought, boy, I had just been thinking about Maggie at the time. I thought, I wonder if she's finally passed. Yes. And then I get home and there's a, a voicemail on my machine saying, you know, I just want to let you know, this, this is from the sun, saying that Maggie has passed on. And so what does that mean? That, you know, you're like the crossing the River Jordan. It's a classic sort of symbolic motif that you see, of the river sticks, et cetera, et cetera. And so astrology is based on very much the same sort of mindset that everything, an eclipse happens, you know, it's, it's, is it because there's a force when Mercury goes retrograde like it is right now? Is it because of some force? No, it's because of there, there's, there's a symbolism involved in our lives. And that's what the, why I called my first book, The Waking Dream, which is this notion of you can read the 
events in your everyday life like you read your dream symbols mm -hmm. it's, they reflect who you are there is there's not a it's not accidental the things that happen to you versus the inner states and it's it gets complicated and i don't want to get too deep into the weeds with that but it's there's a connection yes well i mean it brings up it does open up a can of worms let me just fire some at you because finally i mean you'll be the authority here and you could put things to bed you could put, you could put things to bed for us okay right i mean it's it's a long standing question that i have that i ask every single astrologer you know i've 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 had a reading with you my main astrologer is lynn bell i've read a lot of rick tarnas i think you know this idea of how does cosmos and psyche meet how do they interplay how do they touch and of course, you know, it's it's split down the middle of this whole side of like the mechanistic side of people talking about, you know, you know, the solar flares and energy and quantum wave. And, you know, that there's some there's some mechanistic explanation. And I'm not hearing you say that you're denying that. I'm hearing you say that you favor a more metaphoric or what you call a, a meaning world, a, a worldview based on meaning, yeah. which I find, you know, it, it has, a, I guess, a, a richness. And, and, you know, so if that's the case, that beauty is in the eye of the beholder and that it really is a subjective process, how, how does general forecast in astrology actually work? I mean, does it, is it, is it contingent on the seer i.e. the astrologer giving, sharing their perspective? Is it truly individual? How would it, how, how, how are, you know, when people give a, a broad brushstroke forecast, like Pam Gregory's got millions of followers and she gives a, a broad general forecast, and yet it, it really becomes so individualized, not only because of each individual horoscope, but also more particularly to this point, how each person is reading the tea leaves, their own perspective. How do you explain the, how do you, how do you put those things together? Uh, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, you know, there, there's been a movement in astrology since the nineties. I think it's since the nineties uh, uh, promoted by a certain astrological writer that uh, astrology is very individualistic in the sense of um, that it's almost of a divinatory process where the individual astrologer, well, it's like, it's almost comparable in some people's minds to tea leaf reading or crystal ball uh, interpretation where it's the individual picks these things up almost as a psychic mechanism, but it's not as much based on the external. And there is that component, that divinatory subjective component. But the example I used, um, in the newest book I go into it about is astrology divination. Uh, is how you had the three outer planets come together in the 6th century BC, you know, Neptune, Uranus, and Pluto. And as Tarnas talks about in Cosmos and Psyche, in this quite brilliant chapter about the triple conjunction, it's towards the end of the book, and he talks about the, the axial religions and this epic change that happened in society in the 6th century BC, and he ties it to the triple conjunction of the outer planets. Now, the thing is, those three planets weren't discovered yet. Astrologers mm. had not learned of those planets until Uranus was discovered in 1781, uh, Neptune in 1846, and Pluto in 1930. So how do you factor in this idea that, well, astrology is based on the median of the uh, divinatory dynamics of the individual astrologer uh, reading things like they would reading tea leaves or, or yarrow sticks in the I Ching or you know a crystal ball there is something going on that is a beyond the individual mm. and as astrologers we're reading the signs and the symbols and uh but there there is a divinatory component we've all had the experience as astrologers where you well most of us anyway where you do the chart <laughs> and you use the wrong time or the person gave you the wrong time and mm. it still comes out accurate because I think you pick up on certain things intuitively, psychically. Yeah, things so, don't seem to intuitively add up if, if you have that missing birth time or inaccurate birth time, something like that. Yeah, and it's not always true, but it's true enough that you realize, boy, right, it's, it's, there is something that happens when you're experienced enough at, at a discipline that you tap into something intuitive that is just maybe not there for a beginning astrologer to the same degree. Now, I don't, I don't know if that's answering your question. Let me just add, 
In other words, astrology is a combination of, of these, these dynamics of the universe on a personal level, on a symbol, on a collective level, and on a universal level. There's these symbolic correspondences that interweave all three levels. It's like a, it's like a, uh, the, the Schopenhauer quote that I open up one of my books with, I don't remember which one, about how we're living inside of a vast dream uh, of, a, of a great dreamer. And there we have the individual dream that is nested within the collective dream and that's nested within the cosmic dream. Mm -hmm. And I, I personally buy into that because it's the one that makes the most sense in terms of explaining what I see over doing this almost 50 years of how, how does all this work? How is this possible? So. Yeah, I think it's, it's a big question. So it's worth just mining. I mean, <clears throat> you're talking about nested eggs. And so, you know, in a way, at the personal level, there can be differences, but maybe at the cosmic level, there is something to, well, let's lose, let's use a classic example because the conditions under which you and I met were the Jupiter Saturn 2020 January, was it 9th January, yeah. the conjunction. And maybe you Around can, maybe we, what's that? Around that time. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder if we could maybe use that as an example and go through these nested eggs. So maybe on a cosmic level, there is something to it, more of a universal archetype, if you want. But then it can have these sort of divergent or different impacts on person personality, the way that you interpret it, for example, and then also your own horoscope within it. Uh, I don't know if, if we could set that up as a way of di dissecting or workshopping this broader question that I'm asking is how does cosmos and psyche relate? Let's put it in, let's put it in an actual conjunction and, and see if we can trace, trace it from its most global to its most personal. <clears throat> I'll do my best. You know, you take this conjunction of the outer planets, Saturn and Pluto, uh, Saturn is on the boundary, but you take those two slow moving planets, Saturn and Pluto, which come together you know, every couple, two, three decades. And they came together in January of 2020. And uh, now, even if there had been no humans on the planet, that conjunction would have happened. And you probably would have seen certain repercussions in the environment. You know, if you had been an alien watching Earth with a telescope, you might see certain kind of Earth changes. You might see environmental things over the long haul, because the conjunction has long-term effects. It's not doesn't all happen right away. It's like a seed is planted. And when you say effects, you're talking causal effects then? Uh, ooh, that's a tricky word. <laughs> uh, I, I don't mean causal in that sense. It's kind of like, it's symbolic repercussions more than causal effects. I, I don't want to get too much into that, but I'll, I'll come back to that. I'll circle back around to that point. But so you have the, the certain energies that unfold as a result of this cosmic pattern that's happening in 2020. But now let's say you put humans into the picture. And so let's say certain societies, certain cultures and nations, certain races might be affected by that energy more than others because of how it's factored into, into their racial horoscopes or to their uh, national horoscopes, you know, or like what happened in 9-11 when Saturn and Pluto opposed each other and that affected the US horoscope. and you know, in Manhattan very intensely. But then you have how it affects the individual within those societies. So for example, Saturn-Pluto conjunction, conjunct in, uh, conjunction in uh, 2020 might have fallen right on top of someone's sun, but it might have barely affected someone else in their horoscope. So it vectored into the, someone's personal life very differently, you know, depending on their personal horoscope. So you've got the personal, life nested within the collective horoscope, nested within the cosmic sort of horoscope. Yeah. And, um, and, it's, and I, I really hesitate to say causal. It's, it's, it's more synchronistic. And yet it, there is a time lag with conjunctions. You know, so it looks like it's causal, but you know, it's, 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 it's very hard to explain. And I don't think I'm, it's above my pay grade to explain <laughs> that. Well, maybe, maybe you can help share, shed light on maybe what Jung's theory on synchronicity was and, and how and how, how you use them. Because you're using, a, you're, you're sticking to your guns here. At least you're consistent, right? You're saying 
when I pressed you on causal, you still want to say when there's no human beings on the planet, it's still symbolic. Okay, let's go with symbolic then. Tell us about Jung a little bit, how he influences your work, his, his theory of synchronicity, how it fits in with astrology perfectly. Well, I first learned of Jung's theory in college when one of my professors, who was a Jungian, I had two film professors. One was John Schofield Luther, and the other was Stan Brackage. And Brackage was a staunch Freudian, and Luther was a uh, staunch Jungian. And he would talk about synchronicity. And he, and that fascinated me because I had been interested in synchronicities you know, per se since I was a kid. I would read stories in the newspaper, and I think, wow, how could that happen? You know, incredible uh, coincidences. So I started getting into it, but then I got into astrology and I realized that astrology took synchronicity to another level. That it was not A, just a personal phenomena, B, it was not a rare phenomena. Uh, well, for example, one of the things that Carl Jung said about synchronicity was that it was a rare phenomena and he defined it as an a-causal connecting principle. Things that come together, that have no logical connection between the two and yet they arise at the same time. And he also said they were simultaneous, which I don't agree with that either. Uh, and I realized through, through astrology, astrology was the science of a-causal connections, of correspondences. Mm -hmm. Carl Jung acknowledged the, the traditional theory of correspondences, which are this, this subterranean network of symbolic connections. It's, it's as age, age old, it goes back through prehistory. We don't know who first came up with it, if anyone did first come up with it. This idea that there are symbolic, for example, Mars is connected to fire, Mars is connected to the color red, Mars is connected to war, it's connected to uh, uh, arguments, etc. And these are not connections that are causal. These are connections that have a deeper metaphoric connection. Mm -hmm. And astrology is the science. You look at a person's chart, and if you understand the law of a-causal connections of correspondences, you can extrapolate from that horoscope to all kinds of things, the person's health, their professional life, all from these basic sets of symbols in the horoscope. Mm -hmm. And I started to realize that Carl Jung was trying to distill the phenomena down into an explainable form that might be you know, accepted by you know, the academic community. And he made certain sacrifices to do that. But what I was trying to do with the waking dream was, especially in the last chapter, show how there's a much broader view of synchronicity that I think Jung was aware of, but he was, again, he was trying to appeal to a scientific you know, audience um, that our lives are filled with synchronicities, not in the sense of those rare coincidences, but in the sense of these synchronistic connections of subtle kind of, uh, connections like uh, the one that Carl Jung talked about was he had a, a patient that was going through some was seemed to be blocked in her progress to kind of work through her problems and she had a dream about an Egyptian scarab and as she was telling the dream there was a tapping at the window of the therapy room and it turned out to be a beetle the closest thing to an Egyptian scarab in the Swiss latitudes I think it's latitudes and he went to the window, opened it up, and took the beetle and handed it to the woman and said, here is your scarab, and it kind of broke her through. And it was a symbol. It's, the scarab is, is a symbol of rebirth. You know, it rolls the dung, and it, it, it was interesting layers of symbolism to the, the beetle. Mm -hmm. And um, these things have, it, it did not cause her breakthrough. It was connected to this shift she was going through. I mean, it was, it caused in some sense, it did trigger, it served as a, it was kind of a, a, a trigger for her. But the fact that it appeared when it did, when she was talking about a beetle in a dream, yeah, that one did not cause the other. And that sure. was, no, I, I, then, I, then, I, then I think, too far off the track. I mean, I think in, in that case scenario, I think, okay, it's obvious that Jung has his eyes receptive to see the symbolism, but it, it must be true also that the patient was willing to interpret or, or see the meaning and value there too. Yeah, she was receptive at that moment, yeah. yeah. She could not have been. I mean, she could easily have just said that doesn't mean anything, but according to Young, it did have a trigger effect for her. Well, I mean, you know, it bring, if I could take a step back off the question and just have an observation with you, and especially since you've raised this timeline that you're 50 years into your career with astrology and, and you're such a huge proponent of the meaning worldview. I mean, 
our society has gone so left brain, so linear, so uber rational since the age of reason that I think it's a real service that you're standing firm on this worldview. I think it is the fact that we cannot see the world from a symbolic point of view, I think actually is accounting for a lot of the diseases of civilization in a way. It is a kind of root cause because it represents a huge imbalance in the psyche, a split in the psyche, in other words, a favoring of logical, linguistic, mathematical kinds of thinking without the sort of intuitive, symbolic language. I think it, it, it represents a kind of amnesia or a uh, you know, sort of anorexia of the soul, if you will. And so, yes, I mean, I think the time that we're living in, there needs to be much more return, if you will, to the symbolic way of, 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 of seeing the world. Because science, in a way, can't capture the, the spirit of the human being in context. It can only distill and reduce the, the, the human being into a kind of materialistic plane. It can talk about atoms. It can go quantum. But really, we're much more than that. And so this sort of atrophied, anorexic view of humanity, I think it's it's time to bring these two twins that have been separated at birth together, science and metaphor, if you will, or the intuition or or this sort of you know meaning-based paradigm. So I really appreciate what you're saying. I wonder if you have any comments about that. Well, what I'm saying here is nothing radical, and it's something that a lot of great, some of the greatest geniuses, certainly in the creative field over the last few centuries, have adhered to, like James Joyce and Herman Melville and Goethe. Uh, there's a great line, uh, I think it was, well, I can't think of the name of the writer. I, I open up the uh, my latest book with it, but we have lost the cosmos. Mm. How do we get back to that? And um, there, uh, there's a, a, a poet, uh, Muriel Ruchreiser, and she had a line which I'm going to probably butcher, but it was basically the 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 universe is composed of stories, not atoms. And it's this idea that wow, that's we've, beautiful. We've lost um, we've lost an important dimension of the cosmos, and it's not that one is more important than the other; it's that they need to be brought together. Uh, Carl Jung certainly his whole life, I think, was about this. Uh, Joseph Campbell, I think, through his work with mythology, was trying to reintroduce this this way of thinking, and. Um, you know, James Hillman, a lot of different people have, have talked about this, either directly or indirectly. So it's, um, yeah, I think it's, it's, an, it's, it's, an, it's imagine an analogy of, of, let's say a scientist were to come across a copy of Moby Dick and they decide to study the book by putting it under a microscope and putting it on a scale to weigh how much the book is and to analyze the the history of the paper and the ink and all this, but they don't bother to read the text. In a sense, that's how we're looking at the cosmos. We're looking at the cosmos in a purely quantitative sense. Mm. Getting back to astrology here, my one teacher, Shelley Trimmer, he had a simple way of putting it. He said that astrology is simply astronomy that is interpreted symbolically. Beautiful. So astrology takes the same basic facts as, uh, as the astronomer does, but infuses those with meaning. And so it's not denying the astronomy of it. It's not, you know, ignoring that. It's not denying that there are solar flares and all these things have a significance, but it's saying there's something more to it than that. And this requires a shift of perceptions, what academics refer to as a hermeneutic kind of perception, uh, which is why I can't really be quantified or studied. And there are attempts like the Gogolin research and those are interesting, but ultimately it, to, to read something symbolically as opposed to literally, it, 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 it requires stepping out of that literal mindset of looking at things just in terms of surfaces and quantities and you know, that sort of thing. I found astrology, I mean, I've had periodic astrologic readings most of my life, but recently in a way they've been so helpful because we're in such turbulent times. I, th I think the 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 uh, reliance on this kind of perspective, this meaning making apparatus that you're talking about, it's not 
you know, I, I want to I wanna just bring up the free will versus destiny piece here, too, because I think it's important you flush that out for listeners in terms of how to use it. What does it imply about, uh, you know, outcome and uh, the, the, the relationship between, you know, choices? Yeah. Um, boy, that's a big topic. I, I, <laughs> I'm another throwing the big ones at you. <laughs> I, I, I think the second chapter of my, my latest book, uh, uh, stumbling across the script deals with this, this sort of question about, and I'll use the metaphor from that chapter. Imagine that there is a village. This is all the thought experiment, of course, but imagine a village where all of the villagers have been put under a hypnotic spell by a master hypnotist, but they don't know it, but they've been predisposed to acting and thinking certain ways by this master hypnotist and they're all living out a script that has been devised by the master hypnotist, you know. And one day, one of the villagers happens to stumble into an office where he sees the script that the master hypnotist had that lays out everything that all of the different villagers are supposed to do and will be doing and have been doing. Now imagine what that would be like to suddenly see your name in a book and you're gonna be doing this on such and such a day and you realize that you've been doing these things. It would be an existential crisis that you'd go through because you'd realize I'm just a puppet on the one hand, but there would also be an element of freedom. Why? Because you'd suddenly now have a choice of whether to act out the script as it was laid out or not. And by the, I don't know if that quite makes sense, but the point is, when you see your horoscope for the first time, it's a bit of a shock because if it's, if it's done well, if you go to an astrologer and they know what they're talking about, it's a bit of a shock to realize that your life is laid out in this weird pattern of stars and planets when you were born. And it's similar to that example I used to the person who stumbles across the script because you realize that Am I programmed? Am I just, are all of my actions and thoughts predetermined? But now when you see the chart and you see, for example, I have a, let's say I've got a Mars square moon coming up. And that is classically an energy where very few people can avoid it in terms of, it tends to push your buttons and make you very angry. Mm. And even when you're an advanced astrologer, an experienced astrologer, and you see this coming up and you say, oh, I'm not gonna respond <laughs> and it comes up and you blow your top at something. You go, whoa, yep, I'm more of a puppet than I thought. But at least you, you have some awareness of it. And astrology does give you a certain different, a distance from the energy so that you can have a little bit more choice. I still think we're programmed to a great extent, even when we know astrology. But astrology gives you, or the other example I've used is uh, before the before the operation, I was riding my bike every day through the local forest preserves. I, 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 I still ride a little bit, but I was going through the forest preserves and I saw that I had a, uh, a difficult transit coming up uh, that could be slightly accident prone. Mm -hmm. And the brakes on my bike were a little faulty. They were a little you know, weak and I, I thought, well, I'll put it off. But then I saw this aspect coming up and I said, I don't, better not take any chances. So I brought it to the bike shop. I had the brakes fixed. I'm riding down the prairie path near here. And a lady with her dog is coming from the other direction on the path. And the dog runs in front of my bike. And I was going at a pretty, pretty good clip. But I, I, I knew I had this aspect. And I, I put on the brakes. I, I was slowed down a little bit. And I put on the brakes. And I worked like a charm. And I missed the dog by maybe two inches. Now, that would not have been the case if I hadn't seen that aspect in my horoscope. Mm. where I would have gone to have my uh, brakes checked and fixed. Yeah. So, you know, I, I still probably, because I was going at a pretty good clip and I slowed down, I would have probably, uh, you know, if, if I hadn't have fixed the bike, I definitely would have hit the dog, even yeah. with slowing down. Does that, does that kind of convey some of my sense of... It does. And, you know, what it brings up for me that I think, you know, because we share, you know, fondness and we share a, an Asian worldview also. I mean, it's starting to sound like karma theory too, because, you know, there's a great misconception that karma theory also means everything is predetermined. And, you know, cultural, you know, 
institutions have used that for political gain to sort of subjugate populations, such as a caste system or something like that. Right. But, <clears throat> but on the other hand, true karma theory always shows that yes, I mean, you, you're, you're dealt a, you'll, you're, do you deal yourself a hand, but with an, with as much conscientiousness as you can muster in any given moment, you can also choose how to, to work with it. And so I think there's always that sort of interplay between something that's sort of dictated to us and then how much free will, how much, how much conscience, consciousness can we bring to bear to work with it? Uh, it reminds me of a story of one of my teachers in the Tibetan tradition where, you know, they, they make extensive offerings uh, to the deities. And, you know, one, one of the stories is that, you know, they, they, they mitigated a, ma a major catastrophe because of this karmic ritual and it ended up being that they had, they sort of had to experience the repercussions in a much less magnified way as a result of the ritual that they conducted. It wasn't that it completely expunged it, but it sort of mitigated it. It kind of like it, it was it was helpful to kind of mitigate the power of the impact or the consequence. So that's what came up to my mind when I heard you when you heard you talk about it. There are a lot of these remedial measures in astrology, especially Hindu astrology and Tibetan astrology, to kind of offset or soften the blows of these energies. And that gets into a, a, a vast set of topics. But I want to quote something I heard years ago. I heard a spiritual teacher make, make the comment that he said, you can't be free of your karma until you first know what it is. Well, there it is. That's perfect. That's exactly what you're saying. Point to that. It's like, how do you know if you're really free of your karma until you know what that pattern is? And astrology is one. It's not the only tool. I think reflection simply reflecting on your yes. life and your patterns gives you a lot of insight, but astrology gives you an added tool. I mean, I work with Lynn Bell and with my clients. So I will see clients for psychotherapy. I'm a psychologist by trade. So I, I will, my, my, my way into the psyche is through intuition and just learning and listening deeply to people's story. And, and, and sure enough, there becomes a kind of pattern recognition of the unconscious. And then I'll send those clients to Lynn and, and, and then they'll come back to me. And there's incredible congruency with multiple interdisciplinary perspectives, but it's, it's like a different language, but it really is very mutually reinforcing a lot of, and, but one thing that I really do like about astrology that I think sometimes gets missed, you know, from the forest for the trees is, is this long view of people's life, the long trajectory or the six month perspective. Uh, you know, sometimes being close to someone, you're really listening to their most immediate situation, whereas the, the chart really can be a wonderful predictor of six months or longer, which I, I find that to be extraordinary, extraordinary uh, aid. Uh, how's your how's your energy? Uh, yeah, I'm doing OK, but I want to mention in light yeah. of what you said. That first astrology teacher of mine, Maureen Cleary, who had her background in psychology, and she, she was kind of a wunderkind, you know, in her mid-20s teaching with the heavyweights like James Hillman and all that, uh, brilliant psychologist and very skeptical of, of fringe stuff in astrology. And she got into astrology, as I've told the story many times before, because she set out to write an article, uh, a mass market article on astrology, criticizing it for psychology today. And so she wound up doing her usual kind of Scorpio intensive research. And after a while, it started to take her off guard because she realized this stuff really works. Mm -hmm. And it wound up causing her to shift over into astrology with a psychological perspective. But she made the comment once that uh, studying someone's chart for 20 minutes sometimes gave her more insight into someone's patterns than talking to them in therapy for six months. Yeah. And that was an extraordinary thing for me to hear because that was like in my first couple of weeks of studying with her when I was just getting into astrology. I think Jung would have concurred with that. I mean, there's no there's no question in my mind he was using those to really, you know, those charts, those horoscopes to really uh, blend with his with his therapy and his dream interpretation and the rest of it. I mean, I think it was just a very powerful uh, augmenting tool, supplemental tool to his whole kit. Ray, I'm going to transition here because I want to. I want to do. I do want to get into your chapter 20 of your new book. And but before we get there, I um I want if you if I could ask you to to set us up properly for the book uh, for the chapter because the chapter is really on 
the age of Aquarius, and I don't think that that's, I think to set it up best, I, it would be great if we could learn just a little bit about the great year and the procession of the equinox. Uh, one of the books that I was able to come across in my career was the uh, Sri Tekwar's uh, The Holy Science. Right. Um, I'm not sure if you're a proponent, but possibly through Shelley and the Self-Realization Fellowship, that's, that's a, a work you, you, you trust and rely on in terms of uh, his take on the great year and where we are in the cycles? Yes and no. Ah, <laughs> good. Okay, we love the nuance. I devote an entire uh, somewhat lengthy appendix in the new book to Yukteswar's theory and to the yoga theory in general, which I have some serious reservations about. Uh, it's without getting too much into this because it's it, it could it gets very technical, but it's based on a very different phenomenon than conventional great age theory is. It's based on a numerical or numerological principle of a ratio, four, three, two, one. The yogas are based on numerical divisions. It's not based as much, uh, if at all, really, on astronomical or astrological phenomena. It's based on this unusual way of cycles of history based on this numeral numerical division uh, ratio, I should say. So, so for for so just for clarity, the great year, maybe the more Greek version of the great year, would be vastly different, somewhat different, slightly different than very, than different. You, very different. Okay, very different because the great year, as I, I don't know if I would call it strictly Greek, but the great year, as it's been, well, we're not even sure exactly where it started. I mean, I think that's controversial because a book like Hammett's Mill implied. Uh, again, I don't want to get too far into the weeds here, but the great year as we understand it in terms of the great ages is based on the movement of the, of the vernal point, which is where is the sun in the first moment of spring? And because of the earth's tilt that moves backwards across the constellation 70, every 72 years, one degree backwards, and it's moving now from the constellation of Aquari uh, Pisces into Aquarius. It takes about roughly 26,000 years to go all the way around the, the, the sky. And we're at the tail end of the um, uh, age of Pisces, and we're, in my opinion, clearly going to the age of Aquarius. People, it's a point of heavy debate in the astrological community whether we're really in the age of Aquarius. I think we're in an overlap point where we clearly have a certain amount of Piscean energies with fun religious fundamentalists, for example. And on the other hand, we've got the high tech space age high computer internet age of Aquarius. And we're at this transition point. Mm. And it's roughly, each age is roughly 2,100 years, though it varies depending on the size of the constellations. And, uh, and it's, again, it's not a uh, causal factor. My old my late friend, Alice O'Hall wrote a book for us when I was at Quest Books called Jungian Synchronicity. Well, the new title is The Heavens Declare. But she talked about, you know, she was a Jungian and she also talked about how the great age theory is not a causal thing. It's the movement of the vernal point through the sky is a symbolic marker. It's, it's one of the astronomical things like Shelley said that has a symbolic meaning. And so it's a, it's a, it's a tectonic shift from one age to the other. And we're seeing these major changes in society. Like the abortion debate I claim is one of those debates between the old uh, paradigm and the new. The old paradigm is heavily Christian Piscean, the uh, compassion for the underdog unborn. And I'm not passing judgment here. I'm talking about you know, an objective sort of view of the, the mindset of these two paradigms versus the personal rights, you know, personal freedom, pro-choice sort of thing, which is very Aquarian. Mm -hmm. And so it's this you know, butting up of tectonic plates between these two very different ways of seeing the world. And it's one of many things. You, you see that clashing of ages in literature, for example, like Moby Dick, you know, where you have this, you know, Ahab represents kind of the new world sensibility, the corporate, you know, the whaling industry was kind of one of the first corporate industries. And, you know, taking down the whale, you know, when, when the age of, uh, you know, the, the, when the age of Taurus segued into the age of Aries, you have occultists talking about the Israelites 
worshiping the golden calf and, and Moses and Mary, let's say, no, that age is past. So you have the passing of the torch, you might say, from one symbol, the one icon to the next one. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a quick overview. I don't know if that does the trick of what you're asking, but that's... Well, it's great because, I mean, I'd love to talk with you for hours, but we'll save it for another day or we can refer we can refer listeners to your work. Uh, I've I've definitely read some of your online work because, you know, in order to structure my new new book, I was putting it in the context of the great age. Like I, I personally feel it's important that we understand the energy that we're swimming in right now to make sense of it because it's so volatile that I really think taking a hundred or 200 you know, foot view of it is really incredibly helpful. And especially with the way media is right now, with all the inputs that we have, with all the kind of agendas, let's say, hyper, hyper polarizing agendas, I think it's so refreshing and necessary actually to take a big deep breath and take a hundred foot view and see that what's happening amidst us right right now is a great sea change and i think in order to really frame that the great year is a perfect perfect science to really discuss that and then that that really then sort of if you if you if you see it as nested nested eggs or nested dolls then it then you can understand where we're coming out of and what we're heading into and i think from there we can really make sense of some of your was it uh, 21 things worthy of knowing about the Aquarian age? Because I think this is, uh, when I was reading your recent book, this this was a chapter that I think probably will be really, really relevant uh, to people. I, I just as, I mean, it really relates to this meaning-making, sense-making apparatus that we're talking about is there's so much going on around us and it's so easy to get A, distracted and and be sucked in or, or, or see, you know, thrown off. Um, but once you put this meaning making lens on and you start to see what's really at play, I think it really does offer that slight bit of opportunity to work with it in a different way. So, you know, one of the things in the chapters, you've, you've already laid out the timing. So you have this Procession of the equinox, some twenty six or twenty six thousand years for a full rotation. Each of the each of the increments on the clock, if you will, are about twenty two thousand one hundred years. We're probably already amidst, depending on which astrologer you talk with, we're probably already amidst the the great sea change. Of course, this is not a hard fast line, as you rightfully say in in the numerous places I've read. This is more like a like where where do you find the tide as it comes in? There's no single point. And then, and then we find ourselves, you know, a couple of the a couple of the points that you raise, the rise of the air element. Maybe you could talk about that because that is also, I think, that there therein is a, another opportunity to get some detail to help us to help orient us. What are we looking for? What is what's the implication of what you're saying when you talk about the air element? Well, the, the elements in classical astrology and classical esotericism, they're archetypal principles. And uh, they have physical forms in terms of earth, water, air, fire, but that's the deeper meaning are kind of archetypal states of consciousness. And we're moving from an age of water, the age of Pisces, into the age of air. Now, what does that mean? Water is more of a, an emotional sort of uh, paradigm. And it, it deals more with belief systems. It deals more with devotional factors. It deals more with, uh, well, what would be a good way to summarize this? It's, I mean, it's not good or bad. I mean, the positive side of it is, I think that the age of Pisces has been incredibly positive in terms of an awakening of conscience, an awakening of soul, you know, you, you look at some of these ancient mythologies like ancient Greece and, you know, let's say um, Oedipus does some nasty things and he's, he feels bad, not so much because of conscience as much as it's like a stain. It's, it's not the same way we think of, I mean, there's shame in pre-scientific societies and pre-Christian societies, but you don't really find conscience so much. It's, it's there, but it's very rare. The age of Pisces brought in an awakening of an inner dimension. And, um, but it wasn't so much rational. Sure, there's always been rational people, Archimedes, et cetera. But 
in general, that wasn't the, the mainstream sort of perspective. And then the age of air comes along, the, especially the Enlightenment era of the 1700s, you suddenly have you know, the age of mythology kind of taking a back seat, the age of religion not being as important, people putting more of an emphasis on logic and science. Um, you know, the, the age of air is an age of more, where rationality is in the ascendancy, where it's, we look at our eclipse, for example, not so much in terms of, to use a, maybe a, a cliche, a dragon eating the sun, you know, like this, this mythological imaginary mindset as much as looking at it in terms of scientific measurements, in terms of quantifying it, in terms of the calculations and the understanding of these things from a more kind of mathematical standpoint. And again, you find these things in some ancient cultures, but again, not the predominant perspective. So the age of air is one in which we're literally there, whereas the age of Pisces was an age of great sea exploration. The age of Aries, uh, age of Aquarius, age of air is becoming an age when you see airplanes and jets and going into outer space. You know, that's mm -hmm. the literal external exoteric symbolism involved. Mm -hmm. But again, it's, it's well, and individuals that are, let's say, heavy air signs, Aquarius, air, um, Gemini, and Libra. They, there's a lot of intellectual brilliance there oft times, but there's often a detachment. Mm -hmm. I'm a Gemini, so I speak from experience. I understand the air element from a personal perspective. And every element has its pluses and minuses. And the age of air will be one in which there's incredible knowledge of uh, seeing the script, as I put it in the book, you know, understanding the script not only behind the stars, but human psychology, seeing what is behind the, you know, the gears, like opening up a watch and seeing what, you know, the gears, how they're running. The downside is there can be detachment, you know, like we're living in our own little techno bubbles, you know, we're c communicating to everybody through smartphones or we're, you know, we, yeah, we know it's happening overseas. That's a great advantage. On the other hand, you know, we, we sometimes know more about the person, you know, thousands of miles away than we do our next door neighbor. You know, there, there can be that certain distancing with the air element and logic and all that. Now, does that, does that kind of cover what you're Yeah, wondering? no, it's giving a flavor of like, you know, the air element, what, what's, you know, how do we pick it up so far? I mean, the, the one that I thought maybe you'd pick up on, maybe, maybe not, the, uh, the pandemic is airborne. And I wonder if that, that has any bearing in, in how you see this. Yeah, some have suggested that. And I think that's probably valid. You know, I, I didn't come up with that myself, but other astrologers have. And I think that that's part of it. Also, the fact that the almost exactly when Saturn went into Aquarius, which is a group community oriented sign, friendships, community, Saturn goes into Aquarius and suddenly social distancing is the predominant mean. You know, you're suddenly having to close off from people. When Saturn moves into a sign, you see the more constrictive element. And so that was, I think, kind of touched on what I said about the techno bubble thing, people communicating yeah. through technology. And it also it wasn't a causal thing. It wasn't that Saturn moving into this mathematical segment of the sky caused people to suddenly social distance. It was a, it was a synchronistic type of connection. Yeah, so that's really interesting. I mean, we're communicating right now via Zoom and we live in this, I mean, it, I, I like that there's not really a judgment. It has this sort of positive and negative aspect. Like the world has forever changed as a result of the pandemic. And we are now living a kind of ethereal life. I mean, I can travel, we can communicate, we can live, you know, live in, in cyber communities in the cloud, essentially, you know, this way with Zoom. On the other hand, some really essential part of our humanity isn't really being fed. And I wonder if this is a sort of dual aspect of the of the of the sign that we're heading into. Yeah, I mean, that's every sign, every great age has its strengths and its weaknesses, and that's why when people talk about, well, I, I've literally had people say, "Is you know, is the Aquarian age a good thing or a bad thing?" You know, in, in as many words, and I say it's both. Yeah. I should, like I could say yes and then respond to that question. And likewise, the age of Pisces, was it a good or a bad thing? Well, it depends on whether you want to look at the Inquisition or Bach and Beethoven and, you know, St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, you know, it's, it's I, you have to move beyond, in my opinion, these sorts of judgmental black and white 
it's it's always going to be a combination. Well, I think it gets played up in the media. I mean, you know, the the hair, you know, broad, you know, stage performance of the age of a coming of the age of the Aquarius right. or, or whatever. I think it, it captures the imagination. But I think, listen, let's move to this other thing, the Aquarius Leo polarity, polarity, because I think there are also there's complexity and nuance uh, here. I think this is more specifically talking about the quality of of Aquarius, if you want to qualify it, where, how would you qualify it? And then how does Leo fit in? Uh, yeah, there again, it's not all good. It's not all bad on the positive side. You know, Aquarius is the group. It's the masses. Leo is like the king or the queen of the, on the throne. So on the one hand, I think that that Aquarius Leo polarity is going to manifest through you know, democracy as far as you know, the taking down of monarchies, of leaders, of, of autocrats, that type of thing. Uh, but the constant struggle, it's, I don't think autocrats are ever going to go away totally, but I think that it's, it's ever since the, the, uh, the discovery of Uranus, which is when I think you really saw the Aquarian age, kind of the first wave coming in. You see, do you, do you uh, think in England that that'll be the end of the queen and the end of the monarchy? Do you see we're, we're heading in that direction? Yeah. Well, it already yeah. is in the sense of the power, you know, the, yeah. the royals wield. But there may be some figurehead there for quite some time, but that's all it really is at this point. But so that's the positive side. Or it can be, is, is democracy positive or negative? Well, you know, it all depends on how you look at it. It's, is it mob rule? Uh, or is it going to be some enlightened group sort of uh, majority rules? It's, it's, it's both. It's, mm -hmm. it's, and, but the, on another hand, you know, the Aquarius Leo polarity uh, again, the positive negative side of it is that each person discovers the king and queen inside themselves, as my friend Lawrence Hillman likes to put it. Uh, that's a positive thing, the self-empowerment thing. We are in the age of Pisces, which was a, a Pisces Virgo polarity. That was more of a self-denial thing. And that has its positive side, but it also can be the image of the 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 person flagellating themselves you know that self-negativity pound another nail in me guys that sort of thing but it also can be the humility it can be the kind of internalized sort of opening up of the soul but so the negative side of the aquarius leo polarity i think is this kind of narcissism people walking the selfie generation type of thing of mm -hmm. yeah it's it's good to be to, the self-empowerment is a fantastic development the negative side is it can be you know, so fixated on the self that it becomes, you know, eclipses the broader perspective of soul. Yes. So again, not looking at it all, it's all, all good or all bad, but as both. So would the Aquarius, let's say something like Facebook or the metaverse, what's, if you could dissect the Aquarian Leo polarity with something like the metaverse? Well, you know, it's, Facebook and the internet generally is to me just an exquisite expression of, of Aquarius. It's, it's, it's a technological community and it's, it's life lived on a more mental plane in a more technological plane. And, um, you know, I've often used Facebook, I think, as one of the key symbols that really show that we're moving into the Aquarian age. You know, we're not totally out of the Piscean age. I, I grant those people that say that. You know, they're, sure, we're still in it. But how could you possibly say that the Facebook and the internet are Piscean age manifestations? So it's, there is the danger, I think, with virtual reality of a, a purely mental existence. Mm. And whereas in the, you know, I, I I gave a lecture a few years ago for an astrological conference where there's a famous, not famous, but there's a, an iconic image of someone with the syringe shooting up and the syringe is in the form of a Christian cross. Mm -hmm. The Piscean age, I think was a certain addiction to religious belief, like, you know, Marx's opiate of the masses type of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the addiction of the uh, Aquarian age? I think it's electricity to some extent. We're addicted to electricity. If we lost electricity, what would happen? Society would totally collapse, except right. for those, you know, the survivalists that are living in their teepees out in the, in the woods. 
So I think that it's, it's not just electricity, it's also that sense of social community where you look at, and we're all susceptible to it, I think, most of us anyway, to that addiction to always checking the likes on Facebook, you know. It's, um, you know, it's in a different sort of addiction. Does that mean Facebook and the internet is bad? Of course not. Right. Is, does, you know, any more than religion is bad. You know, it's anything can be taken to extremes. Yeah, so I think you're there, you, the Aquarian, would it be fair to say that the Aquarian age is one of uniting all of us, a sort of universal sense? So we're all connected via the, the ether, we're all connected via Facebook. Does it have its advantages? Yes, we're, we're more connected or, or via Zoom during the pandemic, are we more connected? And what is its shadow side? <laughs> My mind is the shadow side. Right. Like the Borg in the old Star Trek series, you know, the yeah. Borg. Yeah. It's like the downside is it can be groupthink. Yes. You know, it's this constant tension. Yes. And I think we feel it. I mean, the other. With the election, I mean, I think once Trump was elected, I just feel that there was a sea change with media. I feel like the level of polarizing indoctrination and agendas from both sides, both sides. I mean, the technology that unites us also becomes a main line for agendas that can infiltrate us yeah. and so that that is that's what i find very troubling on the other hand with the leo polarity you're saying the individual can rise up now the individual can take a stake the individual can have a platform anyone can have a platform anyone can sort of challenge back you know uh does that have a shadow side it has enormous upside to to say that you know even common people, less empowered people. This is an age where people, anybody can fight for their right and should fight for their right uh, and have their word. Uh, on the other hand, you're talking about your concerns about the narcissism. It's like, what are they saying now that they have a platform? What kind of contribution to the misinformation, disinformation, and how powerful do you know how you know where, where there's power there needs to be responsibility so there, you're going to find people that have platforms without much responsibility i wonder i wonder if you have comment about that yeah you know it's it, look I, I don't want to get political but look at how certain political leaders have used twitter or look at how elon musk you know the concerns whether they're valid or not of what he might do if he gets twitter for instance uh look at the power that um uh Zuckerberg wields. Yes, yes. You know, this media, I mean, this new age has given individuals to rise up out of nowhere and do great things or horrible things. You know, I, I, I talk in the book about the Beatles coming up out of working class families and exerting an extraordinary influence on the world, including influencing the fall of the, so the USSR. Which, mm. uh, and but on the negative side, you know, it's it's it can also lead to groupthink, and it can lead to one person hijacking this technology in a way that is way out of proportion for an individual. So it's again, it's that it's that high wire act. Yeah. Of, of you know, how do you? What's the what's the balance between regulations and freedom between you know restrictions and liberty with these sorts of technologies? It's, there's no simple answer to that. I'm going to wrap it up with two short questions for you. If you want to take a stab at your astrological analysis of the Ukraine war, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And then we can end with just any kind of wisdom that you'd like to share after your 50 years, whatever, whatever, whatever sort of message you'd like to broadcast that really essential and per, per, pertinent to the times that we're living in. We'd love to hear that too. Uh, I'm not sure what to say about the Ukraine situation because I'm still analyzing it and it's a work in progress. And I see it as related to the Saturn. I see it as, you know, the Saturn-Pluto conjunction in 2020, that has long-term ramifications. Sure. And I think that what we're seeing, the turmoil we're seeing is part of that in the middle, in the, uh, in the Eastern European area. Uh, I don't know which way that's going to go. I tend to think I have a uh, the, the last part of my book uh, deals with the America Russia relation and how Russia to some extent represents the Piscean age. Uh, it also has a foot in the, the Aquarian age with its science and technology, but then the America is definitely more in the Aquarian age. And so there's that 
the tension between America and Russia to some extent is the tension between adjoining paradigms. And so I, I, I don't have any simplistic forecast of what's gonna happen. I do think it is partly related to that Saturn-Pluto conjunction and the turmoil that we're going through, mm -hmm. the long-term turmoil, which lasts for decades actually because of the Saturn-Pluto, but also, and also the Pluto return for the US. Yes, you wanna so say something about that? Found itself basically on a Cold War footing with Russia almost to the day that the first Pluto return triggered in late February of this year. I mean, that's, that's pretty uncanny. And uh, that Pluto return is going on for America this entire year, really, at certain times. What, what would you expect, symptomology? Like, what do you expect? I mean, we see the crisis in energy, the inflation, the food, the food shortage, supply chain cut. What, what else? And, and also just tremendous reevaluation of virtues and values across the, yeah. and, and tremendous polarization. So the, as, as a non, uh, non, you know, as a, as a non-astrologer, those are clear to anyone to see. How do you make sense of that data? Three years ago, I wrote an article from Out Astrologer that is, you can find it online on astro.com if you type in Pluto in my name, Pluto Return. It was about, I was predicting what might happen in 2022 and the years following with the Pluto return for the US. And I cited seven areas to watch. And I mentioned abortion issues as being one of the key things. I mentioned social unrest, et cetera. But I also talked, I closed off the seventh point dealt with America having to face its shadow in terms of the legacy of racism in particular, slavery, and uh, you know, the, the, not just towards blacks, but the issue of Native Americans and or Asians in America and so on and so forth. And so what America is going through and what every country I think that has a Pluto return, which happens about 240 plus years, when, when a nation goes through a major Pluto aspect, we went through one in the 30s and there's a lot of uncanny parallels between the 1930s and now for the US, uh, is facing up to things like minorities and, and uh, you know, the races, blacks, uh, Latinos, Asians, et cetera. It's like, and also the issue of power struggles and democracy versus auto, uh, autocracy. Like in the 1930s when Pluto opposed the natal Pluto of the US, you had the rise of pro-fascist movements in the US of, of people like Charles Lindbergh and Ezra Pound, you know, backing this movement towards fascism. And we see the same thing happening now. You know, there's a, a shocking uh, percentage of the US public now that is pro-fascist that you know, is per perfectly happy with getting undermining democracy and wanting to take over the electoral system and by force if necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, but also I think that the, the, the racial issues, I, I spoke to a friend this morning that's involved with Native American issues and she's personally involved with um, America taking a hard look at some things about the Wounded Knee Massacre that have been covered up and uh, you know, tr various massacres besides Wounded Knee. And you just recently had this thing about 500 deaths of children in the US, you know, in, in the schooling system and all that, like you had in Canada. Yeah, in Canada. This dark stuff bubbles up to the surface. When England went through its uh, third Pluto return, it had to face its legacy of slavery, which began under the second Pluto return. And it ended slavery around that third Pluto return in the eight, early 1800s. So a lot of what America is going through right now has to do with looking at, at itself in the mirror. And some people don't like to do that. They want to have this, you know, Mayberry sort of view of the U.S. and U.S. history. And the Pluto is saying, no way, you, you got to face up to this right now. And you got to face up to the history of violence and racism and all that. And some take that as an affront to you know, the American spirit, you know, it's like saying, don't go through therapy. It's bad for you. Don't face up to your dark, you know, the darkness in your past. You know, you can't heal your wounds. We should just paper over them. So that's a lot of what America's going through. Mm -hmm. Maybe the whole world to some extent, because as America goes, so goes the world to some extent. Mm -hmm. Now, your, your last question about do I have any... Yeah, what kind, of, what kind, of, what kind of message you want to leave people with, Ray? Especially I don't people know, that I, don't know if, I, I need to think about that. I don't have anything <laughs> simple beyond what I've already said. It's, yeah. 
it's just you know as I've gotten older it's uh, I think the single biggest lesson that I, I that you you learn and I, I think a lot of people besides just myself you learn to accept yourself more you know you, you tend to be so self-judgmental when you're younger and uh, you know you get much more comfortable with yourself despite all your flaws and we've all got plenty of flaws and I'm much more comfortable. I mean, I'm a hugely imperfect person, but it's like, hey, big deal. You know, I can laugh at you know, those imperfections and I'm not going to get it all resolved in this lifetime. That's fine. I only have eternity to get it resolved. So that's fine. That's my great pearls of wisdom. We'll end on that note with Ray Grassi. Thank you so much. We've enjoyed your contribution to the field of astrology, all your mentors are shining down on you so happy with what you've been able to pass on and we enormously appreciate your visit with us here on the wisdom keeper podcast looking forward to morph out of you and we will make sure everybody gets a little catch a glimpse of your new title book coming out and all the rest of your body of work including fantastic photography also ray i've got to say some of those stunning images on your website until soon all best wishes thank you for listening to the wisdom keeper podcast if you've enjoyed this presentation of sacred knowledge kindly like subscribe review and share our podcast and video series on youtube with your network so that more people can benefit from these teachings and together we can create a brighter future. If you're interested in my online courses, our community membership, and pilgrimages I lead, consider visiting the Contemplative Studies program at gradualpath.com. Until we gather again, all best wishes.